Hey all, welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I'm Darren, I'm your host, and today I've got another great guest who's been on before, Chef David Petrancic of Breville Poly Science. We're going to discuss some of the things that they have coming out or have just come out. I'll be right back with Dave Petrancic. Smoking, grilling, getting hot and hotter, sous vide and chilling from fire and water. Hey all, I want to take a second and talk about Inkbird's brand new instant read thermometer, the IHT-1S. This thing has a lot of great high-end features and a very affordable price. It is 100% waterproof with an IP67 rating, a 2-3 to three second ultra-fast response time, backlit, fully rechargeable, no batteries to replace. This thing has got all the high-end features that you would want in an instant read thermometer. Very durable. So check it out, guys. Check out the Inkbird IHT-1S instant read thermometer. I think you're going to love it. It'll be your go-to instant read from now on. And now back to the Fire & Water Cooking Podcast. Welcome back to the Fire & Water Cooking Podcast. I am Darren. I am your host, of course. And today, I've got another great guest. I've had him on before. Mr. Dave Petrancic, he is from Poly Science, Breville Poly Science, and he is on the, uh, I guess, professional side of the Breville uh, brand, where they deal strictly with commercial type products for restaurants, food service industry, and we're going to talk a little bit about the new products they have coming out and some of the things that they're, they uh, are working on or have worked on here recently. David, welcome back. Thank you, Darren. Thank you so much for having me. Um... So I guess to dive into a little bit uh, for people who haven't seen our first our first interaction. Uh, well, it wasn't the first time we met each other. I think we met at the sous vide summit two years ago, and then shortly thereafter was on uh, one of your one of your podcasts. What did we discuss on the first podcast? I don't even I don't even recall. Well, was just it? pretty much what what Poly Science you know did and all that. I think it was before these new products came out. So just tell them uh, who you are, where you live, and and uh, your little little history about you, and then who Poly Science is. Right on. So yep, I'm Dave. I'm the chef of Poly Science. Uh, functionally, I work uh, in marketing and NPD uh, products. I have my hands in a lot of different things in Poly Science. Uh, before my time here. Um, I cooked for about 10 years around the uh, city of Chicago. Uh, that's where I'm from. Uh, I've cooked in some great restaurants. Uh, so a lot of them weren't, they were great back then, but now there's Michelin Guide and those restaurants have our Michelin stars. So that's pretty cool. And Bib Gourmands and all of that stuff. So uh, I worked at some highly accoladed restaurants and I did that for, like I said, for about 10 years. And then I decided it just wasn't a lifestyle that I was you know, fit for. And um, then I decided to, uh, I took a very, t- I took a quick break and I started working for Sur Le Tab, um, a home uh, cooking store, if, if, no, if someone's not familiar with it, you know, home appliance and, you know, culinary stores sell plates and all that stuff. Certain locations have classes and I taught classes there. I didn't work in retail. I was a chef instructor there. Um, it's not anything like a culinary school or anything like that, but I, I did teach uh, culinary classes there while I was trying to figure out what my next move was. And um, one day there was a sort of, a, it was sort of dumb luck. I was a big fan of poly science and I was this, this sous vide nerd. And this, I mean, this is, you know, uh, 10 years ago, something like that. I was a huge sous vide nerd and a big fan of what poly science was doing. And there was this post on Facebook that said, hey, we're looking for people to join the culinary team. That's all it said. Sure, let's, let's, let's sign me up. Let's do it. So I sent in my resume. I heard nothing. And then like six months later, I got a call completely out of the blue that uh, did I want to go for in for an interview? And uh, yeah, I did. <laughs> so that's, it, that's been history. I've been with Poly Science now for um, eight, nine years, and it's uh, been super awesome. My role has evolved dramatically over my time here. I started out just um, answering culinary questions on the phone. Uh, placing orders, doing invoicing, all of this stuff that was not anything like what I thought it would be. Uh, and then I started to move in a more creative role, uh, doing photography, uh, some video work, uh, writing recipes and stuff like that for our book Immerse. And then that stuff kind of snowballed. Um, in 2014, uh, Breville acquired Polyscience Culinary 
from Preston Division, uh, sorry, Preston Industries, which was Polyscience Industrial and Polyscience Culinary. Uh, and they actually had a small uh, photography business at the time or a magazine called Photo Techniques. Nobody really knows that. Um, so they bought the culinary piece. Uh, so since 2014, I've been a Breville employee. And um, since here, I've worked uh, much the same in that advisory capacity with customers of all, um, of all sorts of backgrounds. I work in new product development. So I'm on the forefront of figuring out what's next for us and then also supporting our current line of products. Uh, and I also work in marketing. So any of uh, photography or videography, um, printed literature, digital assets, any of that stuff that we need, I either do it myself or find someone else to work with to do it. Um, and I do a lot of this. I do a lot of trainings, do a lot of in-person engagements and stuff like that, which is where I met you uh, at Feed Summit. And uh, yeah, so that's me. That's what I do. You said that like an all-in-one breath. So I, I like ran out of <laughs> breath, just uh, had to catch my breath just listening to it. So <laughs> I've done that but, many times. Let me tell you that it's all it's on. It's, a, it's just stuck in the back of my head and I read it. With the back it's your elevator head. speech, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, what do you do? Hey, boom. Wow. I work for PolyScience, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I don't think a lot of people understand that PolyScience is one of the first innovators of the sous vide circulator and that um, they, they started out. I mean, their biggest business was lab equipment and stuff like that. Industrial equipment. It wasn't culinary at all. And that's right. Why don't you kind of explain just a little bit briefly how that kind of worked out? Yeah. So in uh, 1963, we made the first, uh, actually, it was our first immersion circulator. I can't claim that it's the first immersion circulator, um, but we made our first immersion circulator, which was called the Polytemp, Polytemp Model 53, I think it was. Um, and we've made all sorts of other analytical equipment like Geiger counters and oscilloscopes. Um, one of the things that we, we were most famous for is that we made the thermal cycling unit, uh, that tested OJ's gloves. Uh, that was a poly science, poly science, uh, product. Um, very, very big into chillers. So poly science on the cooking side, people know us a lot for cooking, heating, like immersion circulators, you heat with them. There is a whole world of, um, refrigerated immersion circulators for analytical use and also um, chillers. So a chiller is like a gigantic box uh, that has a tremendous cooling capacity in it. And they're used to cool everything from like uh, lasers to uh, mammogram machines, um, industrial machining equipment, uh, CNC machines. So PolyScience's main market is, uh, is chilling. And we've done some fun, fun stuff with uh, like Heinz Ketchup was a fun project. Like you, have, you probably never noticed but your Heinz ketchup is the same texture when it's extremely cold from the, or not extremely cold, but when it's at 40 degrees in your fridge, uh, up until if you have it out at room temperature, it flows at the same rate. And that's by design. And that was tested with a viscometer uh, that is uh, temperature controlled by a polyscience immersion circulator. Uh, Anheuser-Busch was doing some uh, accelerated aging studies uh, or sorry, thermal cycling studies on their beer. So when they brew a beer, they put it in bottles, it's in their temperature controlled warehouse. Then it goes on a truck, uh, goes across the country or wherever to distribution facilities, then probably another truck, then to uh, your local liquor store, then it might sit in your car and then finally be at your refrigerator, right? So what they did was uh, we, we created a temperature bath, we called it the beer bath, and we uh, filled it with all of these, we made it so that it would fit all of these beer bottles. And then we ran these um, temperature cycles because that beer did not taste the same after all that temperature cycling as it did when they produced it. So to get the taste, that signature taste of their beer, uh, they altered the recipe based on this data uh, to produce a new flavor for their beer. I don't think a lot of people understand how much science goes into a lot of the products that we buy, whether it's, you know, food it products. Or, I mean, uh, one of the things too, I think people, if they've ever watched the, uh, you know, Chopped or the Food Channel, the Food Network, the uh, uh, anti-griddle is a poly science product too, that uh, that yep. they uh, kind of invented where you just, if you want to cool something, you know, really quick on that anti-griddle, which is instead of a hot, you know, flat griddle, it's uh, extremely cold and it chills stuff like instantly. So, yeah. yeah. The 
the anti griddle was one of the products that kind of put us on the map as like a really innovative thinker. So in, in 2005, we were the first people to um, supply chefs with submersion circulators. We know that we were the first person. Uh, because, and we know that because the guy who was looking for it called all of our competitors and they told them no. And they told them like, you're crazy. We use this for like DNA sampling and all this other stuff. And you want to cook fish with it, you're, you're out of your mind. Uh, so that was uh, like, so we were famous initially for sous vide, but then as we started to expand to things like the anti griddle, that's kind of what gave us this like, um, sort of heritage or this kind of, you know, persona of like, Hey, these guys are bringing innovative things. So the anti griddle was um, a product developed with uh, chef Grant Eckett's of a linear restaurant here in Chicago. He had this idea that he wanted to, um, uh, freeze things or create something that was both frozen and liquid at the same time. And how do you, how do you do that? So at that time, poly science was kind of a, a, almost a little bit of a hobby of poly science. Uh, or sorry, of Preston Industries. Poly science culinary is a little thing. And uh, so Philip, he made one anti griddle, or he made two anti griddles, one for Grant and one for himself, thinking it would <laughs> never become anything. And then, you know, chefs talk like Wiley Dufresne and that WD 50 finds out he's got one of these things and he wants one. And then John George wants one. And then, you know, it just kind of, you know, chefs talk and it snowballs. So uh, the anti griddle is now uh, one of our best selling products you know, 10 years later. And um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool, pretty cool piece of equipment. Uh, pun well, intended. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And it, and it seems to me that all the stuff that, you know, it's designed for the, you know, the restaurants, it's not, you know, cause a lot of the stuff that you guys make is higher quality, higher end It costs, you know, money because it's a higher quality, higher made product it's not something yeah. that it's going to come out of uh china you know they're going to make five hundred thousand of them and you know have a margin of like you know 10 percent and be able to just you know put them on a boat and, and ship them over here and make a ton of money everything that you guys make is built to last it's it's built to take a beating um the sous vide circulators have always been on the high higher end because they're made for uh, to take a lot of abuse and for exact precision. They're not made just to be cheap. They're made to last a long time, to work when they're supposed to work, to be at the exact temperature, correct? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, that's that's another part of kind of what made a, what put us on the map is that all of our products, I mean, they last with, with, you know, if you take care of them, they last forever. I still see our circulators from 2005 they still pop up every once in a while and people have them. They might be just kind of hanging on the, the, the sticker on the front has kind of fallen off. Uh, I seen one guy, he had a rubber band around his uh, because he said that it, uh, it started to like shake. So we had a rubber band around it to hold the knob in place. Um, so people love those things and they, they do, they last forever. So uh, that put us on the map. Um, all of the stuff is machined to an ex Oh, did I, did I lose I'm, I'm, you? Nope, I'm going oh, to uh, website. pulling up the website so people can actually go to poly, poly science culinary uh, and they can see the stuff that you guys have. And some of the things we're going to talk about here is the new uh, hydro pros that you guys came out the new uh, design of the circulators, which is really exciting to me because they've incorporated a lot of uh, the newer technologies and some of the stuff that um, I know that the uh, some of the competitors have been working on as well. But just uh, if you guys go to polysciencesculinary.com, you'll be able to see what we're talking about. Another thing that you guys came out with was the smoking gun. Um, that yeah. was one of the first uh, companies to create that. Now, there are a lot of those on the market now that are cheaper, cheaperly made, but this here is a, you know, professional, uh, you know, high quality smoke gun. <laughs> so, yep. So, so we created the original smoking gun. Um, I think we might have a patent on that somewhere. Um, but Philip was at, he was actually at a Tiger Direct and if someone doesn't know what that is, Tiger Direct used to be a store where you could go and buy pretty much any, it was a store like you would walk a retail store, they had brick and mortars, and you could go in there and pretty much find anything you needed that was like a, a control board or a keyboard or mouses or the laser for the mouse, you could find anything from a Tiger Direct. And um, he was looking for uh, a vacuum for his keyboard. And he was also, he was working on a project. He had like smoking uh, food sort of in his mind. He wanted to do something with that. And he saw this vacuum cleaner 
And he was in the store and he said, well, instead of sucking the air in, why don't I just push the air out? And then he ran over uh, to a local cigarette shop, bought a, um, you know, a, a bowl uh, with, a, with a screen, kind of wrestled it together with this vacuum cleaner piece. And once he figured out that he could blow smoke, that was it. So it kind of just happened sort of like, you know, kind of like a spark. And we we're the first people to create it. This is the new generation right here. This is the Smoking Gun Pro. Uh, so our first, our first foray into the Smoking Gun uh, was awesome. Uh, but this one's a lot better, a lot more uh, usability, uh, cleanability. Um, super happy with those. And the co control freak is, uh, yeah. if people don't know what an induction uh, cooker is or induction plate. Um, this is the induction plate on steroids, correct? <laughs> yeah, so the, so the control freak um, doesn't have any, induction in general doesn't have any heating. Uh, it uses um, induction technology, so ma based on magnetism, uh, to create heat from the cookware that's set on top of it. Um, and because of, indu because of induction benefits, they're very, um, what's the word I'm looking for, efficient in their operation. And you can also get uh, very precise with them. Uh, so this one, what we did here was uh, stick a temperature probe straight through the glass that touches the cookware directly. Uh, and we monitored temperature something like 60 times a second. And uh, we are able to provide one degree of uh, control uh, in, a, in a pan, which is something that has never been done before. Now, I have a, I have a very cheap induction uh, that I use in my videos and stuff. And I mean, it goes from 350 to like 420. There's no, <laughs> I can't like fine tune it like this here, uh, but it only cost me like, you know, 60 or $70 too. Um, yep. Same technology, but this has got a lot more built into it. This is for those, you know, again, it's aimed at restaurants or, you know, food service where they need to cook at precise temperatures. And this is something other than sous vide. You could actually put your pot and have your water on there and actually cook sous vide in that pot using the, uh, the control freak, correct? Yeah, actually. And actually, so this, this was originally designed for use for uh, for use in restaurants. Uh, recently, uh, it was approved for household use as well, and we're actually selling probably a, a rivaling amount of the this product to avid home cooks uh, as well. They're doing really, really well in the prosumer market uh, as well, believe it or not. And it's uh, $14.99. You know, not inexpensive, um, but home. You know, because of COVID. So many people are not able to go to restaurants. More people are cooking at home. People have budgets because that going out budget just isn't there. Um, a lot of people are buying this right now uh, for home use as well. And it's just the experience of cooking on it. You know, it's not just about the precision. It's about the experience of cooking on it. It's so stress-free. Darren, we got it. We, we'll get you one and then you can, you know, face your own opinion on it. But um, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll get one out to you uh, so you can so you can give it a test drive but I'm telling you it's it's really the experience of cooking on it because you can heat a pan to a temperature walk away for it literally forever and you would come back and it would be the same exact temperature that's not something you can do on the stove or any other um, cooktop and it just kind of frees you up like if I'm sweating something and I don't know my cat you know throws up or something uh <laughs> i can walk away and come back and it's totally fine like it's it's so it's just a much more different it's just a very different cooking experience yeah i think that's one of the things that really um you know attracted me to sous vide cooking initially was precise temperature because i you know i don't think people really understand if you can cook something to precise temperature you know for the for the whole time you're cooking it it's so hard to do. You can't really do it on a regular oven or a stove, uh, like you said, because they're just not made for that. They're, they would cost so much money to buy an oven or a stove that, to get precise temperatures that it just doesn't make sense. So it's uh, to get well, something like the that benefit, you can, yeah. The benefit of the control freak. So as an example, would you notice something that was seared at 400 degrees, 401 degrees, 402 degrees? Absolutely not. But I can tell you that 
let's say toasting uh, toasting spices or sesame seeds or something in there because I make I make tahini uh, pretty often. Toasting your sesame seeds at like 230 degrees and I can just let them ride and they're not going to burn. Pine nuts, pine nuts scorch. If you turn your back for a second, pine nuts burn. Uh, you can just throw them in the pan. They're totally fine. There's just things that it frees you up to do. And there's applications that people will do sous vide that aren't, necessary, aren't necessarily best suited, I think, for sous vide, like hollandaise. I'm a chef by trade. I like to make hollandaise in a pan with a whisk. That's just how I like to do it. I think to have, to have the bag, uh, a vacuum sealer, and a whipping siphon just to do that, yeah, it's great. Sous vide hollandaise is awesome. But I can go to the control freak, set it for 70, 73C, whip up a hollandaise, and it just holds in a pot. I mean, it's, it's so much easier to do it that way. Um, making stock. You could cook stock sous vide. I, throw, I drop a probe in it, set it to 205, let it ride. My pressure cooker. I pressure cook a ton of stuff. Put, this, put the pressure cooker on there, set it to 223 degrees, never over-pressurizes, never under-pressurizes, boom, it's done. It's it's very different cooking experience. Yeah, definitely. So um, I just want to touch on one or two more things here. Like we'll talk about, we talked about the anti-griddle, just so people know what we're talking about here. And if, like I said, I've, I saw it for the first time on Chopped, I think, because uh, they had one on, on that show and yeah. I saw people using them. I'm going, what the heck is that thing? Yeah. And then I found out, you know, years later that it's poly science and that's what it does. And that thing is just a pretty, pretty cool cool little thing it would be a nice thing to have at home i guess right no i don't think so my kid my kid would stick her hand on it and uh you know freeze it off so i want to talk uh, about the, go ahead i just want to talk about uh, the mx2 infuser next too sure um so this is uh this you guys just came out with this not too long ago as well right and this is a vacuum sealer on steroids pretty much a chamber sealer that does a lot more than just seal and uh vacuum seal stuff correct yeah, so the MX infuser, uh, it's in a vacuum infusion chamber, I like to call it. So yes, you can seal bags in it and all of that, uh, just like you would a uh, chamber vacuum sealer. It does all of that more than capable. But it's the thing that's really awesome about it is its vacuum infusion techniques. Uh, its ability to compress uh, solids, infuse liquids, um, brine, make uh, super quick brines, things like that. Um, that's, that's really where it shines. It's, uh, it's got a bunch of presets in it uh, for packaging, sous vide, marination, infusion. Uh, you can create your own presets in there. And it's kind of just one touch operation. And it's, it's super, super accurate. It's accurate to a single millibar. You know, you get a really cheap vacuum sealer and it'll run on like, you know, it runs for five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, whatever it is. But you actually don't know how much vacuum you're pulling. Um, and to get a consistent result, you need to be able to have some degree of precision, some benchmark. So uh, you can program this within a single millibar if you're that um, if you're that in, you know into it, or you can just go with all of the presets that are in there, and you're going to get a perfect result. And again, it's not you know this is not a cheap product. This is not something that's a ma built for the mass market. This is something that is a specialty product. So and it cost money because it's built to last it's built right and it's oh uh, these last forever these things last forever so <laughs> they have a bush uh bush uh i think it's dvp uh, i forget yeah. if it's bush or dvp but they have a uh, um actually if you look under tech specs there it'll tell you if it's bush or dvp but either one yeah dvp uh, uh -huh. yeah dvp makes like some of the best vacuum pumps that are on the market um they're really i mean that's really what you want those are what's quality and um, so it has an oil pump system in it. What's cool about the oil in this thing, actually, it takes only two ounces of oil, two fluid ounces. That's like nothing. Um, and it ships with oil in it. And it has an automatic oil sensing uh, and cleaning system. So it'll tell you when your oil is dirty and then it will make you clean it. And then at the end of it, it'll tell you about the life of your, uh, about your oil, how clean it is when you need to fill it. It also prompts you to run a cleaning cycle uh, where it pulses and holds um, vacuum and releases it to get moisture out of the system. Um, so it has, I mean, that, that is the number one reason that vacuum sealers die. People do not change the oil. People do not maintain their pumps. Uh, and this kind of does it all for you. So in that regard, uh, super, super awesome. Yeah. Like you were saying, a lot of times they die because there's get oil, uh, the oil gets uh, water in it because the water in the chamber or whatever water gets can get into the oil and then it 
messes up all the uh, gears and stuff in the pump. So, or if you have a dry piston pump, so ones that go you like you know run on a on a vibrating pump, those don't have oil in them to flush out the contaminants. So what happens over time when you're pulling a vacuum, you don't see it, but there is small amounts of evaporation that are happening, and then that moisture will recondense inside that pump. Water and metal don't mix eventually they rust out and they and they they seize up uh so that's why you would want to use an oil pump system oh uh, you also have better control uh you get a better vacuum on them and then you can you know maintain them so uh an oil system is what you want this is um two thousand dollars uh it's really an, a, a unique price point because for the features that it has to get something similar to this even kind of similar to this in the commercial market you, you you're looking at like 30, probably 3,000 to 3,500 and up. On the consumer side, you can get a million vacuum sealers at $1,000. This sits in the middle where it's the, the form factor of a home vacuum sealer with the depth of a commercial vacuum sealer, the feature set of a commercial vacuum sealer, and then a price point that's like right in between. So we're super, super excited about that. Yeah, and even some of the commercial ones that are in that price range don't have a lot of the features yeah. that, that has built into it. So yeah, uh, even yeah. our um, this has more advanced features. Um, so we have what we call the 400 series, which is a a, um, a super capable vacuum sealer focused on HACCP, and that one at thirty two hundred dollars doesn't have the same infusion um, and brining and uh, compression techniques built into it that this one does, or as even as de deep of a chamber. Yeah, so there's some some great stuff that PolyScience makes, and um, if you're really into uh, gadgets and gear and things that are going to last you a long time, highly recommend you checking some of them out. Um, there's some other things that uh, they they make, and I'm, I don't want to take the whole uh, you know episode here going into all of that because I want to get into the uh, the new sous vide circulators, uh, the immersion mm -hmm. circulators that you guys came out with. Hey all, I want to introduce you to a company I just started working with, Fresh Jack's Organic Spices out of Jacksonville, Florida. They're a small, family-run company that's fast growing. I've tried a bunch of their different seasoning blends and spices, and I can tell you they are all fresh, all organic. None of them contain artificial flavors or sweeteners. None of them have anti-caking agents or preservatives. They all taste like they were just made for you yesterday. Check them out, guys. They're on Amazon in the link below. They have different sample packs, different blends. Like I said, they also have the individual seasonings and spices as well. Fresh Jack's Organic Spices. Check them out, guys. I love them. Because they're a, a lot different than the ones you used to have. And they've got a lot yeah. more technology built into them. And they're cheaper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how, yeah. how did this call come about? You, you made something with more features, pretty much, you know, a, actually a better size. It actually will fit in most of your pot. So most consumers now can take this and put it in their standard stock pot like you got right there. It's got, you know, an LCD screen and it's got a bunch of stuff in it that the other ones don't have, but it's actually cheaper. So tell me how this all came about. Yeah, so we've been working on the Hydro Pro series for a very long time. These were uh, many years in development. And we took a lot of uh, advantage of available technologies. Um, right now, you can get um, touch screens that are super cheap. It's almost as cheap as buying, uh, you know, just a just an LCD. And uh, so this has a color, a full color TFT touch screen, and I can plug it in and kind of go through it. Um, it. It tends not to look so well on camera just because of the exposure, but uh, we can walk through it if you like. But um, so this is a full color TFT display. Again, because of cell phone technologies, I, there you go. Um, cell phones, uh, tablets, wearables. This technology has come down to a price point that's just really affordable. Um, the motor technology in this. So uh, actually here, if you take a look at this, I'll, 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 I'll give away the, uh, the sh my party trick here. If you switch back to the live view. So you'll see here the foot. This just unclips, and this uh, and the whole impeller system pulls out. And inside, there's nothing. It's just magic. So it's what, this is inductively coupled uh, to uh, a motor on the other, on a brushless DC motor on the other side of it, on the other side of that wall. And this is actually we borrowed this from drone technology. 
drones, special CC motors uh, have super crazy uh, capabilities, um, inexpensive now, and they last forever. So we borrowed that from drones. We borrowed the screen from, uh, you know, just the availability of uh, displays. Uh, what else is in here? I'm trying to think of like what else. Um, well, it's all steel, you know, pretty much steel. It's not plastic, and you, know, you got the plastic for the where your LCD screen is, but everything else is is pretty much steel. Um, and that's a really great feature right there because it's always been a pain in the butt to keep your uh, circulators clean because, um, you know, even though you could be using distilled water in your <laughs> container and they'll still get gummed up and 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 things get in there and you got to run the vinegar and all that in there, you know, at least. I do at least once a month or they get gummed up because I use mine a lot. So, so we actually have uh, in this unit. So those are the technologies that we borrowed. There's so much technology that we crammed into this thing. That's just insane. So on that point, um, we implemented a, a descaling feature. So it'll actually in the screen, it'll walk you through how to set up a descaling bath, uh, recommend um, in acidity uh, per volume, and then it will run a range of temperatures uh, to clean the circulator uh, out and it'll run at different flow speeds. So um, it will clean, it will clean itself. So what else does this have built into it? Let's talk about the sous vide toolbox a little bit. All right, so let's go through, uh, let's, we'll just go through all of it. So the uh, so sous vide toolbox is a guided cooking experience that's built in. Sous vide toolbox used to be an app uh, for iOS and not Android. And that was something for a long time we wanted to change. Um, and we've, Knowing that this was coming, we built it into uh, built it into the circulator. So sous vide toolbox, you basically tell us what it is you're cooking, and then some things about its thermal conductivity, its shape, uh, is it fresh or frozen, how thick it is, um, do you want to pasteurize it? Do you want to pasteurize to a core level or a surface level? So we at, we walk you through all of this depending on what the food type is. Is it a tender uh, cut or a tough cut? And then we simply just press what's on screen, and then at the end it'll say, hey. This is how long it's going to take to cook. We offer you an ice bath calculation. It'll say, hey, if you're going to chill this later, uh, flip this switch, and then we'll tell you how long it takes to appropriately chill this food. Um, and it also has what we call fast cooking. So we'll talk about, the, about this a little bit more, but this is that delta cooking technique where we're cooking at a temperature above our desired finish temperature, and we'll save anywhere from 30 to 50% of cook time by doing that. So you can enable that. Um, and the sous vide toolbox has been expanded. So back in the app days, it was really just about animal proteins, you know, pork, beef, um, lamb, poultry. Now the sous vide toolbox also has lentils, legumes, set custards, fluid custards, root veg, green veg. Um, I don't know if I mentioned fruit. Uh, there's one other thing that I've, there's an octopus setting now, shellfish. There's, it's been way expanded to include a whole bunch of new food types. So. Um, this uh, sous vide toolbox is in both the Hydro Pro and the Hydro Pro Plus. Now, neither one of these do are Wi-Fi or Bluetooth based. It's, everything is inside the unit, correct? No. So, uh, so neither one are Wi-Fi. Neither one have Wi-Fi. Uh, the Hydro Pro Plus has Bluetooth out to okay. the Hasset Manager app, and then Wi-Fi out to whatever you, however you want to manage those logs and data, uh, Wi-Fi out from there. Wi-Fi is, I don't know. I've always scratched my head about it. I know people have like f different feelings about it. And for circulators, like everybody puts Wi-Fi in there. And I think they just do it to check the box. Like, hey, does your circulator have Wi-Fi? Yeah, it does. Okay, what do you use it for? So I could check the temperature. You don't need to check the temperature. Like, well, I don't understand. Or like, I, I don't know. We like to put technologies in where there's a benefit. We added a descaling feature because that solved the problem. Wi-Fi, you still have to go up to the circulator and put the food in. You can't just leave food floating all day. So why can't you just turn the circulator on when you go to set it up? And if the answer is, well, it's up to temperature already, this thing heats up in it'd be super fast. You're saving five minutes, maybe. It's just, it, it, that feature, Wi-Fi just, I don't know. In the case of Joule, it makes total sense because there's no interface on it, right? So it having Wi-Fi to the phone absolutely makes sense. You need that to input the, input the temperatures. Um, but here, all of, that, all of that's built in. Sudi Toolbox is built in. 
I don't know. Just Wi-Fi wasn't something we were hungry for. Well, yeah, if you have it built into the system, it doesn't make sense because the biggest thing with the apps, as far as I can see, is that they have the built-in recipes and, and you know, so like with Jewel, that's, you know, it's got even the little the pictures of what it's going to look at and, you know, and it gives you the ranges. So, you know, it's on your phone. It's, they don't have to build it into the unit. It's cheaper for them, I think, to build it into an app. They can change it and update it all the time without having to worry about firmware updates and stuff like that. So, so I think that I think the opposite. I think it's more expensive to do it that way. What you get, what you get out of that is expedience to market. And I'm not knocking Jewel. Jewel's part of Revel. I mean, I love those guys. I love that they make a great product too. Um, but what you get out of things like that is an ability to change things later. Uh, and I mean, we make hardware, right? To change this is difficult. Um, with the software, you can just make changes up on the fly. The backside of that is you have to be managing that app and a lot, and that's a lot of development work and a lot of time. So there's trade-offs, there's reasons to do it, and there's reasons not to do it. And also for us from a um, health and safety standpoint, when we talk about commercial kitchens, this is one of the dirtiest things in your kitchen. <laughs> So having people interact with this as part of the cooking experience is something we didn't want to do. Uh, so just from that perspective as well, that was just another reason where we were like, you know, we're not going to go that route. So the Hydro Pro and the Hydro Pro Plus, what's the main difference between the Hydro Pro Plus that it offers than the Hydro Pro? Okay, so Hydro Pro Plus and Hydro Pro, uh, both have sous vide toolbox. Both have manual cooking with up to three timers and adjustable flow speed. And then the My Presets feature, uh, you can set, I don't even know how many there are. It's a lot, like like tens of tens of tens of tens presets. There's a lot. I haven't reached the limit yet uh, because it's just a, it's a data file. So there's not an exact number of slots. It's a percentage of memory. So uh, many presets. So, so let's go back to, let's stop there, there and talk about that too, because I don't think we touched on that, where people can actually... If they like their pork tenderloin at 138 for, you know, four hours, they can have that, they can program that into the system and just name it pork tenderloin. And when they want to do a pork tenderloin, pull up pork tenderloin and hit press go and it, and it does that, correct? Yep. So there's two ways to approach it. You could go in through sous vide toolbox and go in the pork cylinder, da, 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 and then put in your um, specific temperature of 138 point whatever. Or you could set it up uh, as a preset where you says pork tenderloin, uh, this amount of time, uh, this temperature, a flow speed, and then if you have the Hydro Pro Plus, uh, a probe alarm for the uh, for the probe. So with the plus with the plus model, that's where you start to get into in manual cooking. You can cook with the probe to alert you or when your core temperature has been reached, uh, both cooking and chilling. Uh, it has data logging features for HACCP compliance or a, some people call it, call it uh, HACCP, uh, and then uh, the ability to connect to the PolyScience Bluetooth HACCP manager. And with uh, the Hydro Pro Plus, um, if any of you guys have seen the, you know, exploring, I'm going to plug Jason uh, on your show, which I'm sure- That's fine. Like, is the, uh, on the, our last Exploring Sous Vide show, we talked, to, and we'll probably talk about it here too, is with the probe, you can, it, you can cook at very much higher deltas and shave off way more cook time uh, if you have that probe uh, capability. So if you were going to buy a, a data meter and a probe uh, separately, you're looking at hundreds of dollars easily, like hundreds, at least a hundred dollars for 50 to a hundred dollars for a decent probe. And then $200 plus for a really good data logging meter with the hydro pro plus all of that's built in for a hundred extra bucks. Like it's, it, there's no, and then, you got, and then you got the Bluetooth capable to, you know, if you're in a restaurant and you need that, uh, I don't think a lot of people, a lot of my people are home cooks and they don't know what HACCP is. So um, just explain what HACCP is and why it's important to be able to monitor the internal temperatures. Yep, so, so HACCP is Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. So basically in a restaurant, we're serving, we're serving people food, their lives are in our hands. It's a very serious thing. Like people think you just go out to eat and things kind of happen magically. It is, it's a pretty serious deal and people can get sick, uh, especially when you're cooking at low temperatures um, and vacuum packaging foods. There's other considerations that need to be in place or you know, taken into account to make the food safe. So uh, the health department will ask you to fill out a 
HACCP plan to ensure that uh, you're adhering to safe cooking procedures and they will go through your plan uh, and approve you or deny you uh, based on what you submit. So the idea with the Hydro Pro Plus is, hey, we're gonna make this stupid simple for somebody uh, to adhere to these guidelines and provide a safe product for their customers. Um, so we created the Polyscience Tacit Manager app. The whole data logging process, you talked about the temperatures. For HACCP, you need to log storage temperatures, receiving temperatures, cooking temperatures, holding temperatures, cooling temperatures, so much temperature data. And we said, well, at least within the Hydro Pro, we can handle cooking and cooling. Uh, so we do that and we spit it out to a log uh, that has all of this information about the restaurant, who cooked it, where it was done, what temperatures the product was uh, put on, uh, put under from uh, cooking to cooling. Um, and all of this is in a, in a report that a chef would normally have to fill out by hand, all of these lines. Uh, it does it all, automatic, all automatically. Now, how often do they have to do that? Just like once a quarter, once a you know once a month or it's not every, like every, single, every every single day every single day for every food product that's cooked sous vide it's a ton of work and for a long time that's like people i, I darren i'm telling you what restaurants that i worked in i'm back in the day the health department would come in we'd throw all of our uh vacuum bags in the freezer we would <laughs> take the circulator hide it in the office uh we would take the <laughs> i've heard people taking their the cooks i've seen them uh carrying the vacuum machine out the back of the restaurant and putting it in the, someone's car I, because people, they would shut you down. They will shut you down. There was a story of a particular restaurant in Chicago. I won't, I won't name it, but if you do enough Googling, you'll probably find it. A uh, particular restaurant, the health inspector came in and made them put all their vacuum bags in, cut open all the vacuum bags, put the food in the garbage and dump bleach over it uh, so that they could not serve it. I mean, it's just insane, the, the, the level of misunderstanding um, within certain you know, authorities. So we're trying to do everything we can to make HACCP this not scary thing and make it, make it super easy and accessible for everyone. So yeah, anytime, let's say if you cook salmon, salmon on your menu, and that was one of your ROP, reduced oxygen packaging uh, products or product that was in your HACCP variants, every batch of salmon that you have to have, one has to be probed, uh, the salmon has to be um, logged the temperature when it comes from the fish supplier into your back door, who received it, when they received it, what temperature it was. Then it goes into this cooler. This cooler is at this temperature. It was put in that cooler by this person at this time on this date. Throughout the time that it was in the cooler, it was at this temperature for this long. I prepared the food during the preparation. Like, all of this has to be logged just so you can put sous vide salmon on your menu. So the Hydro uh, Pro Plus has the probe that you can actually stick in your sous vide bag while it's cooking so you can monitor the temperature the whole time. So let's go yeah. into that a little bit because I want to talk about some other things you can do when you do have that food probe that you couldn't do any other way. So because yep. th that's what's coming out next. And I think a lot of people don't understand why they, they would need a probe or why a, a probe would be necessary and what it, you can actually do if you actually know what the exact temperature of the meat internally is, because I think a lot of people don't understand that just because the water is at 140 and yeah, eventually the food's going to get there, but you yeah. don't know when, and you don't know how long. And yeah. it's a lot of guesswork unless you actually have a probe in there. <laughs> yes. It's all guesswork unless you have a probe in there. If you cook a pork chop this week that you got from, I don't know, uh, Bob's meats, and then you cook a pork chop the next week and you cook them both for an hour, I guarantee you that you arrived at two different temperatures. The very slight uh, difference, uh, differences in, in thickness of the food product make big changes in the cook time needed to reach that, that product. And the only way that you know that you've hit it is to monitor it directly. Suvi Toolbox does an excellent job of calculating it. We worked with uh, Douglas Baldwin, who's one of the foremost minds on um, thermal conductivity. Um, he's done, he actually earned his doctorate um, and wrote a lot of his math based on, um, you know, sous vide cooking. Um, and sous vide toolbox is a very good calculator of that, but the only way to, and the, the health inspectors will look at it as good data. The only thing that they will accept is a true probe reading. But you were talking about, you know, Delta cooking and the things you could do that you couldn't do without a probe. So I'll show you those. Uh, so let's get her turned on. All right. Well, also I, I've done, I've actually got 
a cheaper, you know, a, a, a meat stick, which is a wireless um, probe that you can actually cook in, in your barbecue, your smoker. But it also the one, this one is waterproof, so I can actually stick it in something. And I've, I've played around with it to just see, I, I cooked a prime rib, I cooked the thicker steak, just to see how long it takes to get to where, you know, the, to what it equalizes. And yep. it's really um, opens up your eyes because, you know, it'll take a lot longer. And that, those last couple degrees take a lot longer than you would think, you know, it'll oh, yeah. go up pretty quick and then it starts to slow down. And then, you know, those last two or three degrees to, you know, to finish it off, it, it takes a lot longer than most people would understand, I think. So. Oh yeah. The last two degrees are, are, uh, you know, like I said, 30 to 50% of your cook time, depending on what it is and the thermal conductivity of that protein two degrees could take a very long time. And when I say 30 to 50%, that's of your total cook time. If you've got something that's, you know, gonna take four hours just to reach core, again, half of that is just that last two degrees. So uh, that, it, it, takes a, it takes a tremendous amount of time. So cooking two, de- that's why Suvi Toolbox has that fast cook feature, cooking two degrees over where you wanna finish, you'll reach that temperature much, much faster to shave off uh, that time. Uh, but let's talk about doing it with the probe since you uh, you brought it up. Well, so, we're, another thing that comes into play too is when you, you're cooking a, a tough piece of meat and you want to use the time to tenderize it. So you want to make sure when you hit that equal, you know, your equalized temperature of you're cooking it to like say 135 or whatever, you want to make sure you know when you hit the 135 because anytime over the, when you hit the 135 is when you start to tenderize. So once it hits the 135, it's going to stay there, but then it's going to start tenderizing so that you know, all right, it took me three hours to hit 135. Anything up and over that, it's going to tenderize it. The more it stays in after that, the more it's going to tenderize. Yes. So what this, what the probe will actually allow you to do is um, enter enter a target alarm for the probe. It'll say, hey, I've hit core. And then you can set a, a holding time assigned to the timer that will go off uh at a time past that so whether it's you know you're just holding it to pasteurize it for x amount of time or you're holding it for uh, you know three days to you know cook some short ribs uh it will it will time that out as well so um about the probe a little bit about this particular probe because i think this is i don't know i think it's cool it's one of the things that makes me happy uh the over engineering that we tend to do <laughs> um so the traditional methodology is that you would have a data meter and a probe and probes have an inherent inaccuracy. So uh, they have a range in which they operate. You know, uh, you, they don't, any temperature probe that's out there has a range. You can't just measure the hottest temperature uh, of the sun. You can't measure the, um, I don't know, Arctic ice temperatures. Um, that, uh, temp- thermometers operate within a range. Cooking thermometers operate in a smaller range because we need them to be accurate uh, from, you know, a little below freezing to about boiling to baking temperatures. And that's about it. Your oven does go hotter than 500. So zero to 500, sorry, let's say, um, it's just, yeah, let's just say zero to 500, speaking in Fahrenheit, that's a small range. Some meters go from thousands of degrees to negative thousand degrees. What a, so, wait a minute. You just quoted something in Fahrenheit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm going to tell Jason. <laughs> you guys are influencing me. You're a bad influence on me. <laughs> so, so, so probes have an inherent inaccuracy within their range. So they might be plus one, plus two, minus one, point one uh, within a given range. Uh, and then what you would do is you would offset it. You quote unquote calibrate it, which is not a true calibration. Uh, you would offset it based on, let's say, something like ice point, and you would adjust it. But when you do that, these probes, they don't know anything. It's just a probe. The data meter is what you're offsetting based on that reading. When we developed this, our engineers said, well, what if you take another probe and put it in there? The offset's gonna be wrong. We were like, yeah, but that's kind of what people do. And they were like, this just makes no sense. Why would you ever do that? Like they just couldn't, they couldn't fathom how this would be a commonly accepted practice, right? Because it's so flawed, it's so flawed. So what we've done is we actually put a microchip on the end of all of our probes. That's what's in this uh, little egg-shaped piece here at the end. So each probe remembers its own offset and remembers its own calibration data for HACCP uh, compliance. So you can use any of these probes with any of our circulators. 
So, all right, we'll go ahead and plug this in. It beats to tell you that it's in there. Uh, so we're going to go into manual cooking. And I know this is, we're also, we're also at the mercy of audio. So I'm going to try to be as descriptive as possible in my, uh, uh, in my explanation here. So when you go uh, into manual cooking, it's going to ask you to set up a cooking temperature, right? And this is just, is just like you would do any sort of setting up a temperature with any circulator. Let's say we're going to do, uh, let's just say we're going to do a, uh, a ribeye steak. I'm going to set my bath to 55 degrees Celsius. See, there you go. And then it's going to ask me, how do you want to cook? Do you want to cook using a timer or a probe alarm? And since uh, we want to do a Delta cook, we're going to use the probe alarm. So I select that. And now it's reading the probe uh, up at the top. It shows me my set point, my current temperature, just like a normal circulator. And then on the bottom, it has my current probe temperature. Now I can click it to add an alarm and I'm cooking my steak, let's say in a water temperature of 55, and I'm gonna cook it to a core of 52. So now it beeps at me, tells me, okay, and I see the alarm on the screen and it tells me what my current temperature is. Now I can just uh, put my temperature probe in the steak, drop it in, and it'll alarm me when I've hit that desired temperature of 52 and in that bath that's 55. And like we talked about earlier, that's going to occur much, much faster than if I would have just set my bath to F52 to get a 52 degree steak. So that's called Delta T cooking. And <laughs> um, I think it was, you were the, probably the first one I heard say that. And maybe AJ uh, Scheller from Crea, I heard her say that one time, um, maybe last year or something at the sous vide summit. I, 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 it's been kicked around. And that's one of the things that when you use a probe, you can actually do, like you said, instead of setting your temperature on your sous vide bath, let's say 131 or whatever, you want a medium rare 131, you can actually set it up to like 133 or 134. And then when your internal temperature of your meat gets to within a couple degrees, you can kick it back down. So that it actually cooks a lot faster um, initially, but then you know, you, you, you're not really gonna overshoot it because you're not um, cooking at a super high temperature. Yeah, so you're, so, you're not you're not cooking it on a grill or in an oven at you know 350 degrees, and you're trying to get to 131. It's a lot harder to catch you know jump off the train. Meathead used this analogy once. It's trying to jump off the train at the station when it's going 100 miles an hour. It's a lot easier if it's going you know two miles an hour. You can jump off and and you know be fine and be right at the station. Correct. I'm gonna. I that, I love meathead and I'm going to steal that because that's a great explanation. But yes, you are absolutely correct. Now you can, there are things that you can do. So let's talk about the cook, the different types of Delta cooking methods there are, or the different types of sous vide cooking methods there are. Cause I would say that things fall into three different categories of three different temperature approaches, let's say. Um, so the OG of sous vide cooking, the original method and the method that most people practice is I'm going to set my water bath to the temperature that I want this food to be cooked at. And that's great. You're going to get you're going to get an exact result. But and you can hold the product for pasteurization. But I could do things like pre searing it to pre sear the exterior of the product and then bypass holding it for uh, pasteurization. So additional considerations for holding time or pasteurization via another method, you need to have that in place if you're going to choose to do that that cooking method. The next method would be um uh you know like a 2c delta where we're cooking just above where we want to finish and then yeah i can jump off the train when i need to or i can slow the train down and say i could just turn my i could turn my bath down i could remove the product from the water bath or i could just begin chilling it so that's another thing that you can do then you can cook at extremely high deltas where then you rely on carryover cooking to finish the product so um let's say i'm cooking uh, a piece of, what did I cook on Jason's show? I think I did a pork chop and I cooked it in a bath at 83 degrees Celsius to a core of 52 degrees Celsius and let it carry over to 62 degrees Celsius and call that done. So I, I cooked at a very high temperature, brought it up very quickly and then pulled it out so that it slowed down and arrived at the core temperature that I wanted. The benefit of doing this is thus. I pasteurize the exterior of the product as 
part of the cook as part of the sous vide cooking process. Whereas again, in a low temperature approach, I would have to do it some other way um, or just hold it for you know a long amount of time. And I want to cook as long as I have to, but as short as I possibly can. So I pasteurize the surface with that method. And I also create textural contrast. Sous vide salmon, in my opinion, is not awesome. It's like a, it's like a stick of butter. It's one, it's very unitextural, right? There's, it's just soft and that's fine. The first time that you've had it, you're like, oh my God, the salmon is amazing. Cause you've never had salmon like that before. Everybody's used to eating, you know, overcooked salmon in a lot of cases, um, because it's really easy to overcook salmon. So having sous vide salmon, you're like, wow, this texture is amazing. But then using this high temperature approach, I can create a textural contrast, and, which makes the eating experience much more interesting on your palate, create a textural contrast from the exterior to the core, pasteurize the surface so that it's safe, and cook it way faster. So there's huge benefit to doing it that way as opposed to doing it the way you've been doing it. Um, and you can only do that if you're using the Pro because that's when you know when you, when you start seeing the signs, hey, it's uh, 10 degrees below my core, I'm gonna take it out and rest it to carry over. Uh, and you can't do, and then knowing when it's actually hit that core, can't do that unless you have a probe. Yeah, there's lots and lots of benefits to that. And uh, that's what I want people to understand because I, it's still kind of new to a lot of people and they, they look at it and go, hey, I've been cooking like this, you know, without a probe, just fine. Why would I need it? Well, there's a lot more yep. things you can do when you add, add something like this. When you add more technology or things that you can control, there's definitely more things you can do. Yeah, you can make better food. You can make you can make better food. You can deliver a better product and a safer product. Um, I actually have a, I have a uh, depending on when this post or when people listen to this, I'll have uh, out this week a blog post. So um, if you're listening to this sometime in the future, uh, check out the blog at polyscienceculinary.com. I have a post coming this week all about Delta cooking, actually, and everything that we've just talked about. And I've actually, so the, the pork that I uh, cooked on the Exploring TV show, uh, I cut into all of it. Uh, and then took a very detailed photograph of the interior of all of those pieces of pork. And uh, I won't spoil it so that everybody can go, you know, go through the blog post uh, selfishly, but um, take a look at the difference. Take a look, see what differences you see. Hint, hint, some you don't see. Um, <laughs> and read all about, read all about that there. Well, this is going to air on the 7th of uh, February. So make sure you send me a link to the blog post and I'll put that in the description so people can actually go and, and look at that. So perfect. Perfect. Sounds great. So what else can this thing do on the, uh, with the Delta cooking besides what, what we just talked about? <laughs> okay. So let's talk about, you know, let's just talk about uh, logging of these, of these things. So um more about, and even if you don't have HACCP or anything like that, um, you just want to save information about your cooks. I find that home cooks are super inquisitive about sous vide cooking. I'm now in, you know, a couple of the sous vide forums that, you know, yourself, Jason's on, um, Kevin, you know, some of the, you know, really engaged uh, folks in the sous vide uh, community that we know. Um, and they just, they just want to know more. So here in the screen, and I don't know if you'll actually find a, a, an image of this on our website. I don't believe you will. Uh, but in the bottom right corner of the screen, there's a little clipboard because I have HACCP data logging turned on. And in settings, I've set myself up as a user. I set Dave Transic up as a user. So uh, here, by clicking that clipboard, I start going to this HACCP feature. So first it says, enter the food name. Uh, and it's always fun entering this from like the side or the back side of this product. So uh, <laughs> here, okay, so we've got pork. And you can make that as uh, as uh, detailed as you like, pork belly, pork shoulder, you know, whatever. Enter a name, then enter the thickness. So we're going to say, uh, I have it set up in milli millimeters, because for me, I just, I don't like fractions. I, I like single numbers. So 28 millimeters, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to hit next. Uh, who's cooking it? Again, I'm set up here as a user, so I hit Dave. And then it says, are you ready to start the log? start log. And now it's, it's recording all of this temperature data, all of the information that I have here. And then within the uh, PolyScience Hassett Manager app, I enter, you know, uh, Flavor Bound Kitchen at uh, 123 Happy Street. Uh, my Hassett variance number, 427-2718. I enter um, uh, who my supplier was, where I got, you know, from Slagle Farms. I got my pork from Slagle Farms. So because all of this, this HACCP is all about traceability 
and keeping a track of the flow of food and where things came from, who did it, and again, those temperatures. And then all of this is uh, mashed up with that data uh, and presented in a, in a PDF. Um, uh, so I understand you give them more data than they actually need so it confuses them and they don't even look at it. Okay, I trust you. you if you got all this data. <laughs> actually, it's funny. Um, when we created the log, uh, it was reviewed by um, several health departments across uh, different branches across the world. Uh, we had some people in uh, UK look at it. We had some people in Australia look at it. Uh, Food Authority of New South Wales. Um, a couple, you know, we had a lot of people of varied backgrounds everywhere from like health departments to um, chefs to um, a, a different number of uh, colleges. And we, we made a log that pretty much is great for everyone. Anything that's on there is good across the world. Because again, like we just, when we do something, we do it right. So if you hand somebody this log for a temperature data log, they're going to be pretty happy with you. Yeah, their eyes will cross and go, how much data do you actually have on here? <laughs> yeah, and again, it all happens behind the scenes. Like you kind of set up everything up in, in the Hassett Manager once, uh, all that stuff about your establishment. You set up your users once, and then really it's just when you go to do the cook about entering the information, you know, those things that I just showed you, the, the name, the thickness, all of that stuff, who did it. And then it, it, it kind of pulls all these things together into one beautiful log. So it is really easy to do. Well, David, I think our time's about out. I don't want to go. I could probably go another three hours and talk about all this stuff, but I know you got other things to do and uh, I don't want to bore everybody because uh, us food geeks can talk about these kinds of things all day long, but I want to thank you for coming on. I really look forward to uh, seeing more from uh, PolyScience on some of these uh, innovative uh, technology appliances that they're coming out with. Yeah, I would actually, uh, we should do some time, uh, the, a show on the uh, MX2 infuser. I'd love to do that. We can do, uh, so we'll do some uh, cold brew coffee. We'll make a brine. Uh, we'll make okay. an infuse, uh, some infused vinegars, stuff like that. And I can show you guys how, how the, uh, the infusion and stuff like that works. That's definitely something I'll, I'll, I'll think about for maybe next month or in, a, in six weeks or so, because Believe it or not, I get a lot of inquiries on vacuum sealers. Um, mm -hmm. I was really surprised some of the videos I do on vacuum sealers get a lot more action than than sous vide stuff because people yeah, are, they're getting a, cheaper. Well, well, they're getting cheaper. They're getting people can use them for a lot more things now. And I think with um, all the stuff with the pandemic, people are you know prepping food more. They're they're you know uh, doing all kinds of things with these vacuum sealers, so they become a lot more popular. And people are really, really uh, wanting to know what they can do with them. So I'll definitely do that. Yeah. Uh, when we when we were working on this, it's it's not just what is a vacuum sealer, but it's what can it be? Can we make it a cooking appliance? Well, yeah. I know I can make brines in it. I can infuse things in it, and I don't have to heat them. Like if I'm making a brine, I did. Um, it was uh, my father's birthday this past weekend, and uh, I did a I did a pork shoulder, a brine pork shoulder that I then braised in the oven, and I brined it first. You do not need to, any recipe that says you need to bring a brine to a boil and whatever. It's absolutely, you do not need to do that. <laughs> There's so many other ways to infuse the flavor into that liquid without bringing it to temperature. Um, and, what, and basically just what I did, I put um, it, in the restaurant, we call it a, a third pan and placed it into the, uh, into the chamber with the brine, salt, sugar, uh, you know, bay leaves, chili flake, all of those things put it in there, run the infusion cycle on it. You take it out and you can see the colors even just visually change. Like from the time leaves that has like a little bit of a green tint, you can actually see the level of infusion of, that you've gotten. You can taste it and it's cold. I can drop my pork shoulder right in. I know I don't have to cool it down. Throw it right in the fridge. There's so many things that you can do with vacuum sealers now that you couldn't do before. Well, save that for that episode then. We'll go into a lot of that stuff because I definitely want to do that. But I want to really thank you for going into what PolyScience has. These new and circulators are uh, phenomenal. I really look forward to getting my hands on one. And uh, anything else you want to talk about? Anything else new that PolyScience is coming out with? Um, we're going to focus on the Hydro Pro, Hydro Pro Plus. We do have some stuff that's in the works. I do have a, a number of NPD projects that are on my desk, uh, none of which that I'm at uh, liberty to share. But I do have, uh, we do have a number of things in the works that are pretty cool. Um, so yeah, right now it focuses Hydro Pro Plus. I mean, they really, they just launched in November and we celebrated 15 years with the Classic Series, 10 years with the uh, Chef Series. So 
Uh, these are going to be around to stay for a while. The, M the MX2, we have a bunch of content coming out on that because they came up because it came out and the Hydro Pro Plus was right behind it or Hydro Pro. So we have a ton of content coming out on, on that. And then uh, we actually do have some stuff coming out for Control Freak. That's pretty cool. So lots of stuff. Cool. Well, make sure you guys check out the uh, polyscience.com and um, we will definitely. Polyscience Culinary. Yeah, polysciencecullinary.com. That's right. I just, I lost it there. There it is, polysciencecullinary.com. And then you can uh, check out all the things that we talked about. Thanks, Dave. And they also have a YouTube channel as well, Polyscience Culinary YouTube channel. And you'll see Dave on there because he does, you do all those videos, correct? I do a lot of them. I do a lot of them. Well, thanks, Dave, for being on. Um, yeah, I'll get with you and we'll definitely, in a few weeks, we'll do one on the, uh, on the uh, MX2 there. Cool. Thank All you, right, Darren. Thanks again. All right. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you again on the next Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. Well, thanks again for joining us on the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I want to thank Chef David Petrancic of PolyScience for coming on. Make sure you check out polysciencecullinary.com to check out the products we were talking about. Make sure you check out the Polyscience Culinary YouTube channel. And make sure you join Fire and Water Cooking on Facebook, Instagram, and check out the Fire and Water Cooking YouTube channel as well. I'll see you again on the next Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. Thanks, guys.